So as we get started into this new series, the drain on my sink in our bathroom has been getting slower and slower. It drains just worse and worse. And I was amazed because I really didn't mind as long as it drained a little bit, you know? So it got to the point where I would brush my teeth at night and as the faucet was running, it would be three, four inches of water just accumulating in the sink, even though the drain is wide open. And in the morning, it would be gone. It would have made its way through the drain. So, ah, it's no big deal, right? I can deal with this. It's not like I brush my teeth that many times a day, I use this sink that much. So I'll just let it ride. But then one day, it got totally clogged. And so the next morning, I woke up, and that same three or four inches of water is still there. And I thought, all right, now this thing is totally stuck. I need to deal with it. So I went out in the garage, got the plumber's snake, you know, and pulled the little drain cap out and sent the snake down into the pipes and swirled it all around. And then I pulled out the snake and I don't even want to go into detail (laughs) about what was attached to the end of that snake, but clearly there were other people's hair involved. So this drain clog had been clogging for longer than we've even owned the house. Dealt with that, a drain is running well. A couple years ago, I wanted to tackle the invasive privet that was taking over a corner of our yard. And so uh, one day I decided I was gonna get out there with a chainsaw, cut a ton of it down, and then rented a chipper to get into the backyard. And so I got the chipper and I got Big Red, which is sort of the work truck that's around Grace, do all sorts of stuff with it. And I borrowed that and brought the chipper to the house and finagled it into the backyard, did a ton of chipping, grinding it all up. And uh, it was a great project until that night, it rained an inch and a half. So the next morning, I've got to get the chipper back in order to keep it within the 24 hour rental window by 10 a.m. So I'm up early, no problem. I get in the truck and I'm pretty sure that I can get the truck out of this position as long as I'm gentle on the accelerator. So I get in the truck and I just tap the accelerator and even the slightest tap, the rear wheels just (laughs) spin. No big deal, been here before, spun my tires in the mud. So I go get some branches, shove them under, try it, still no luck. Then I go and get my jack out of the garage, jack the truck up off the ground, put two by sixes underneath the rear tires, try to get it going, still does not go. For an hour and a half, I'm getting more and more frantic because the deadline for the return on this rental is creeping up on me. More like hurtling at me. I couldn't get it done. So finally I had to call my friend Johan, I think here and somewhere. He's got a big old dually truck. We had to take a section off of our back fence. He had to pull into the driveway behind our house, attach the tow strap to the truck and the trailer with the chipper on it and pull us out. And that feeling when you're sitting in the truck and you're tapping the accelerator, you're just spinning tires is so disheartening. You're so stuck. Or that feeling, you know, when your drain is totally clogged. You feel so stuck. And that's what we're gonna be talking about these coming weeks, the situations in life where we get stuck and then how Jesus helps us get unstuck. And it's not just in drain clogs or in spinning tires that we get stuck. We get stuck in all sorts of areas of our lives. We get stuck financially in debt. We get stuck in our habits. We get stuck in our ways of thinking. We get stuck in our own blind spots, stuff that we're not even aware of that we're doing, but it's causing damage all around us. We get stuck in discouragement and feeling defeated. So how does Jesus help us get unstuck? And this morning, we're actually going to look at a subject that is, I think, appropriate for Mother's Day, because most mothers that I know care a great deal about relationships. How does Jesus help us get unstuck in relationships that aren't moving forward? And this is important because you know what it's like. When your relationships are right, you can handle just about anything. I have watched 
people walk through the darkest valleys with incredible resilience because they're surrounded by amazing relationships. But then on the other hand, when your relationships are off, when they aren't right, when there's brokenness and friction, you worry about them, you fret over them, you get frustrated. You burn so much energy trying to figure out how to set them right. And according to Jesus, there is nothing more important than our relationships. When they ask Jesus, what is the most important command? He says, love God, heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor. Now that's not just a statement about your affection. It's a statement about your priorities. Jesus says the most important commandment is that you cherish relationship with God and cherish your relationships with the people around you. That's the most important thing. And yet, this is an area of life where we get stuck all the time. It happens in marriages. Husbands and wives in that slow drift away from being lovers into being merely roommates. It happens in the relationship between parents and children whether it's a communication breakdown or generational gap, differing values, holding each other hostage. Happens all the time. The relationships between parents and kids just get stuck. Friendships get stuck. One person does something that hurts another. Someone gets left out and suddenly that relationship is stuck in a wound. Even our relationship with God can get stuck. Sometimes it's an event in our lives. It's unexpected or tragic. It causes great bitterness. We hold it against God. Sometimes it's simply the busyness and the cares of life that choke out our attention to loving God. It just grows boring and distant and cold. Not because of God's fault, but just because we're distracted in so many ways. So we get stuck in our relationships. And part of the good news, part of the great news of God's kingdom is that his reign and rule can pull us up out of the spinning mud. That Jesus can break up those nasty clogs that rot in our souls that he can restore us, that he can redeem us, that he can help us get unstuck. So we're gonna see how he does that regarding relationships here in Luke 17, verse 11. Just gonna read about eight verses here. On the way to Jerusalem, Jesus was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by 10 lepers who stood at a distance. And lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. The first thing that I notice when I'm reading this passage is that the lepers address Jesus from a distance. This is actually what the Old Testament law commanded them to do. The majority of the law about leprosy is in Leviticus 13 and 14. You might wanna just jot that reference down in the margin of your Bible next to this passage. But a couple of the key verses are on your notes sheet. Leviticus 13, 45 and 46 says, the leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. And he shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean, he shall live alone 
and his dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now when we talk about leprosy, I think for many of us what comes to mind is what is technically called Hansen's disease, which is a terrible disorder that affects the skin and the nervous system. But in the Bible, when it speaks about leprosy here in Leviticus and even into the New Testament, it speaks about skin disorders in a broader sense. If you look carefully at what it says in Leviticus 13 and 14 about these skin disorders called leprosy, the symptoms go far beyond what we would consider simply Hansen's disease or kind of modern day leprosy. And so perhaps a better translation of the word leprosy would be a defiling disease of the skin. And that is significant because our skin is our point of contact with other people. If you shake hands or if you give someone a hug, that's our skin engaging with someone else. And leprosy is a defiling disorder of the skin that quite literally puts people out of touch from one another, quite literally creates this distance from which the lepers address Jesus. But it's not just that having leprosy or one of these skin disorders created a gap or a break in the relationship with people around them, it also created a break in the relationship with God. So, as the text tells us from Leviticus, they were gonna live alone, they're outside the camp. That meant, if they're ceremonially unclean, they could not access the tabernacle, or later on at this time, the temple to worship God. So this disease puts them out of touch with people and out of touch with God. Can you imagine the conversations with someone in this situation? I mean, there's just, you try to talk to them and they're just saying, unclean, unclean. It's a total breakdown. They're absolutely stuck. Not only in their physical situation, they're stuck in their relationships with others and with God. Now, between those, which is worse? Is it worse to be stuck in your relationship with God or worse to be stuck in your relationship with other people? And, of course, if you're here on a Sunday to hear from God's word, to worship God together, it's an indication that you have a sense of the importance of a relationship with God. But the interesting thing is that throughout Scripture, our relationship with God and our relationship with other people are incredibly intertwined. We often try to pull them apart as though it's possible to be doing great in our relationship with God to the total neglect of our relationship with other people. But the Bible, the Bible actually teaches us that we need more than God. I mean, sometimes you hear people say, all I need is God, or me and Jesus are doing great. The Bible teaches that we are wired, created to need more than just God. You remember Genesis 1, Genesis 2? The story starts with Adam in the Garden of Eden with God, unbroken communion and fellowship. Adam's relationship to God could not have been better. God gives him the task of naming animals, and as Adam is naming the animals, there's no suitable partner to be found. And the scripture says in Genesis 2 that it is not good for man to be alone. The absence or the lack of healthy human relationships is not good even before sin enters the creation and messes everything up. Do you understand the significance of that? Our connection to God, our relationship with God, and our relationship with people are vital and they're intertwined. Science reinforces this. They've done study after study after study, and they found that people who are surrounded by loving relationships and caring community actually have less buildup in their arteries. All sorts of other indications of physical health that stem from relational health. One doctor, a guy named Dean Ornish, wrote a book called Love and Survival, and in it he says, I am not aware of any other factor in medicine, not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery, 
that has a greater impact on the quality of life and the incidence of illness and premature death than the issue of connection and intimacy. Isn't that interesting? That both the Bible and the observation of our lives indicates the absolute essential priority and intertwined nature of healthy relationship with people and healthy relationship with God. So this is important, incredibly important, maybe the most important thing. We pay attention to both of these. What do we do when our relationships become out of touch? When our relationships become at a distance? What do we do when we get stuck in a relationship? And the thing that the lepers do here is really interesting. They have this incredible phrase. They cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Somewhere along the line, they've been living in this place between Galilee and Samaria. We don't even know the town's name. They might be vagrant, just sort of drifting from place to place. But they've heard that Jesus has the power to restore. And so they cry out, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And that word mercy, it appears throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, it's a characteristic of God. It speaks of God's disposition, God's desire to show compassion to adversaries, to forgive offenders. And this mercy is an essential part of God's love. And this is why throughout the Psalms, the psalmist will say, God, have mercy, have mercy. Psalm 86 in your notes sheet is a great example of a place where the psalmist is crying out for God's mercy. Now, this word mercy keys us in or kind of clues us in to a couple of different ways that we can approach relationships that are stuck. On the one hand, we can approach these relationships with the cry of mercy, and on the other hand, we can approach them through the lens of merit. Now, the cry of mercy in a stuck relationship seeks to forgive and seeks forgiveness. It's humble. It acknowledges wrongdoing, but it's not consumed with it. Another translation, that word mercy, might be compassion. It's being in touch with the other person. But all too often, we approach stuck relationships through the lens of merit. How do you know if you're doing that? Well, if your mindset in a stuck relationship is that other person should be treating me better, or it's I deserve better than that, because I do this and this and this, I clean your clothes, I make your bed, I fold your laundry, I put it on the top of the stairs, and you still don't pick up the laundry basket and put it in your room and put away your laundry, These are like indications that there may be some of that merit lens involved. You know, we bring this into relationships because we've been kind of raised in an environment where, whether it's in education or it's in athletics or whatever else, it's our approval and acceptance often comes from our achievement. And so the way we handle relationships is more like a contract. I'm doing this and this and this, you should do that and that and that. And if you're not doing that and that and that, then I'm upset at you about that and our relationship is totally stuck. That's looking at things through this lens of merit. And here's what we have to understand. In real relationships built on real healthy love, none of us is entitled to the love of another. That's to say that Love is not a contract, it's a gift given by one person with free will to another person with free will. And we don't treat people kindly so that they give back to us. We don't love to get. No, in healthy love, we love to give. And that our kindness to others, our service of others, that's overflow 
of our love. And so that mindset of mercy, rather than a mindset of merit in relationships, that mindset of mercy is actually not a lack of strength. Having a merciful perspective requires that we be strong enough to trust the other person's free choices. It's actually that posture of mercy is very powerful. Powerful people in relationships are the people who trust the other's choices and are not controlled by what the other person does. So if you're in a relationship and you live in constant fear about what the other person might do or how the other person might blow up, and so you're constantly heaping on activities and things and various other stuff to hopefully mollify or keep that other person content, that's not a particularly powerful relationship. A powerful relationship is one where you're free to give love and you're free from the other's response. You're actually freeing that person. But as we're talking about this, some of you are kind of going, whoa, 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 whoa. Where are the boundaries here? I mean, you're talking all about mercy, but if I'm gonna be merciful all the time, I'm gonna get run over, people are gonna take advantage of me. And boundaries are incredibly important. You don't want to simply let yourself be taken advantage of constantly. The interesting thing in this story is that Jesus regards the boundaries even for these lepers. Remember, he sends them back to the priest. That there are established boundaries for the protection of the community. When people have these sort of skin infections, skin disorders... The priest, according to the Old Testament, had to verify that the skin disorder had in fact been healed before the person is fully integrated back into community. So when Jesus says, go present yourselves to the priest, he's honoring the necessary and helpful boundaries that secure the overall health of the community. So Jesus, the lepers cry out for mercy. Jesus shows mercy, but it's incredible, powerful, freeing mercy within healthy boundaries that are set up. That's how Jesus handles this situation. Now imagine if you are married to an addict. The mercy mindset to your spouse seeks forgiveness, but you also will probably need to put in place some healthy boundaries in order for restoration to be complete. And so there are groups like AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, NA, Narcotics Anonymous. We have an amazing Celebrate Recovery for all your hurts, hangups, and habits on Monday night that meets over here. Great, great, great group. But often those groups can function similar to the priests in the Old Testament who would help to reintegrate people on their journey of healing. And so if you're in one of those challenging relationships, a mindset of mercy doesn't mean that you just continually subject yourself to the same abuse over and over and over again. It means you establish boundaries, but you keep open that posture of mercy. Keep open that healthy perspective on true love. And this is hard. This is, this is painful. It, it does end up often in our hearts becoming tender and even wounded. But just think for a minute with me, the pattern of the gospel story in the Bible. Because of humanity's disobedience, there is a rupture in the relationship between God and people. And that rupture it is pretty stuck, at least from a human perspective. We're bent on our own way, we're bent on rebellion, we're bent on being the masters of our own lives. Stuck relationship. What is God's view? How does he handle that stuck relationship? Does he look at it and say, well, if you just do this and this and this and this and this, then I can heal this relationship? No. No, God exemplifies this incredible mercy mindset in that he comes. He, he sends Jesus, all the fullness of God, resident in Christ, Sending Jesus to the earth, he shows up and lays down his life, willing to be crucified. And then out of that sacrifice, he works a miracle of resurrection that brings new life to a relationship that was once broken. That's the gospel story in God's relationship to us. 
As we work through our relationships with others, it works quite similarly. How do we show up, lay down our lives, and trust God to bring forth resurrection power and healing? And that's what happens here. You know, the lepers show up, even though they're at a distance, they show up to Jesus and they say, have mercy. They humble themselves, they lay down their lives, and then they look to see how Jesus might bring resurrection power into their broken and stuck situation. And Jesus says, go present yourselves to the priests. As they go, it says, while they're on the journey, they were cleansed in verse 14. You see what happens? Their healing becomes reality on the way. And I just wonder what that's like. I mean, was it that they took three steps and then all of a sudden, all the boils and scabs dropped off and they're like, woo, all right, new skin? Or was it more something like they're walking, they're walking, kind of wondering, They're obeying Jesus' words. This is so important. They're obeying Jesus' words, but as they're obeying Jesus' words, one of them notices like, wow, that that looks better. And then another one looks at his leg and all of a sudden they realize, my goodness, the power of God has crashed into our lives. This is how healing so often happens. It's as we go. It's on the journey of obeying Jesus' words. And you know, especially when it comes to relationships, obeying what Jesus says is really challenging. Jesus' words about forgiveness. How many times should we forgive him? Seven? 70 times seven, Peter. Jesus' words about mercy. Jesus' words about boundaries. Jesus' parables. They're very clear, but they're challenging. And so, A lot of times we get stuck in relationships because we simply aren't willing to undertake the journey of obeying his words. But when we do, when we do walk with him, here's what we have to do. We have to learn to see his hand at work along the way. Because a lot of times with relationships, that healing process is just that. It's a process. It's a journey. It takes a while. So we have to learn to see along the way the work of God. In verse 15, it says the leper from Samaria saw that he was healed. They were all cleansed. Only the leper saw that he was healed. Somehow the leper from Samaria saw something more than the other nine from the Jewish community. He had eyes to recognize the work of God, maybe in a deeper way. And so he returns to Jesus and he praises Jesus and and he he gives thanks at Jesus' feet because he's able to see what's going on in the big picture, that, that God's power isn't just healing their physical affliction, it's also indicating that their total hope is focused in Jesus himself. How do we learn to see like this along the way? So we don't just kind of get healed and then keep going about our business, but we return and and we close the loop of gratitude, not just in our relationships in our community, but in our relationships with God. How do we do that? And we have to learn to recognize the good stuff God does. This is, however, challenging. Our brains are not wired necessarily to do this. There's a PhD guy named Rick Hansen who studies brain science and he talks about the brain through uh, view of evolution and, and all of that and of course I believe what the Bible talks about God creating humanity, wiring our brains a certain way. But his observations about how our brains work are still valid and So the interesting thing is our our brains are actually highly sensitive to the negative stuff, to the threatening stuff. And the positive stuff kind of flows right through. Hansen uses this illustration. He says negative events in our lives are like Velcro in our brains. They stick. And the positive stuff are like Teflon. They slide right through. And think about your relationships for a minute. Think about how many years of faithful connection with another person can be thrown out the window in just one awful moment, right? It just seems like those negative things lodge and shape our view 
betrayal and hurt are so painful. Well, what's this about? Well, in life, there is some of that wiring that's connected to survival. Because the negative stuff can kill you. And the positive stuff, you have opportunities through the week and through the year to find. So imagine if you're in a situation and you're thinking about, okay, I gotta feed my family, gotta have kids, um, gonna flourish, all these positive things are over here, but you're kind of walking along and there's a bush over there kind of shaking and you think it's just the wind and so you ignore it, but it turned out it was a lion who attacks you and eats you. <laughs> right, so you miss, if you miss the positive stuff, you can figure out food tomorrow. If you miss the negative stuff, your lion's dinner toast, you know, it's like there isn't really much of a tomorrow left. And so the idea is that our brains are actually wired to be more sensitive to threat uh, because it's important for survival. So there's a great deal of brain space and capacity devoted to fight or flight and threat response and all sorts of things like that. And so a negative moment goes almost directly into our memory. In an instance, we remember those negative things. Even as a child, you touch the stove and burn your hand, it's an instant and it's in your memory. But the research shows that in order for a positive thing to remain in your memory, you have to focus on it for 12 seconds. Isn't that interesting? Do you know how long 12 seconds is? Just think about one positive thing in your life right now. I mean, maybe, you know, you're, you came to Mother's Day, came to church with your mother, and, and that's a positive thing, or, or your wife, or just, just think of a, a positive thing in your life. And I'm gonna, we're gonna start and do it for 12 seconds. Just focus on that positive thing starting now. That's 12 seconds. How often do we focus on anything for 12 seconds? But that's how our brains work. And so I think we see some of this at work in the story here with the 10 lepers. One of the lepers recognizes not only that he's been healed, he recognizes the source of that healing and so he comes back to Jesus. Jesus asks that question, where are the nine? But maybe a good question for us this morning is, am I like the one? Do I know how to see the work of God in my life through Jesus on the journey of healing and cleansing? Because what happens for this one who returns he receives more than a mere cleansing of his physical disease. Jesus says, go on your way. Your faith has made you well. That word well in the original language is like whole or, or fully put together, totally healed. Somehow, walking in that moment of physical healing at an earthly level has now, as he turns back to Jesus, connected into that relationship with God and the surprising thing, the twist in the story is that the one who returns is a Samaritan. And you remember, the Samaritans and the Jews, they had no dealings with each other, it says in the Gospel of John. They, they didn't like each other, and the Jewish community viewed the Samaritans as heretical half-breeds. And yet here, it's the Samaritan who returns and receives the full healing, not just of his capacity to relate to people and be reintegrated into his human community, but also in his relationship to God, both connected. And part of the point is that this kind of touch from God through Jesus is available to everyone. And another part of the point is a bit of a warning that it's very easy to be among the nine who simply relied on maybe their Jewish community connection to handle their connection to God rather than closing the loop and recognizing not only is this healing going to impact their ability to relate to people, but also relationship with God. 
And so this morning, if you're here, this is a really encouraging word because Jesus' power to restore relationships with God and with other people is available to everyone. So how does this apply? First, are there any key relationships in your life right now that are stuck or at a distance or out of touch? You know, Mother's Day is one of those days when families often will come together and I'm sure there are some moms who just hope that today of all days will be a day of peace in our family. But we're not aiming at just peace for one day. We're aiming at healthy and whole, life-giving relationships, those communities of care, compassion, and mercy that declog our arteries. And so we need to take stock, take inventory. What relationships in our lives with other people or maybe even with God himself are at a distance? And if you can identify a stuck relationship, the next question is, what is your cry about that relationship? To whom is your cry directed? A lot of times when we get into a stuck relationship situation, we talk to everybody, but not so much to God about it. These lepers address their cry to Jesus himself, the right person, and they address the correct cry. They cry out for mercy. They recognize. They need forgiveness. They need God's touch. What's your cry? Merit? Mercy when it comes to those people. And then finally, where are you on your journey with Jesus? Is your mind full of those Velcro sticky negative moments? Or can you see like the leper from Samaria saw? The hand of God at work in many levels. Maybe it's just incremental, marginal, little moments of breakthrough. But can you see like that leper, that one leper saw? And can you give thanks for that? Can you praise God for that? Can you come back before Jesus and say, all right, yeah, there are a lot of negative things out there. They're stuck in my brain. But I see this. I see what you did there. Thank you for that one moment. Thank you for that one glimmer. Thank you for that one chink in the armor through which I can see the light beginning to pierce into the stuck situation. Relationships are tough. Relationships are painful so often. But they're so, so, so important. They're essential. It's not good for man to be alone. And so that journey of healing in our relationships usually looks like listening, crying out to Jesus and obeying his word. Seeing what happens. Returning in worship. And obeying his next word, continuing to show up, lay down our lives before God and before others, to look to see how his resurrection power will set things right. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this incredible story.